Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Real Time, where we talk about the movies we like. And the ones we don't. I'm Tyler. And I'm Molly. And today, we're going on the third leg and final of our uh, look through the years at some of the most famous monsters in horror movies. We uh, So now we're going to start with Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1993, 4... Two. What are years, anyways? Year. Ninety-two. Ninety-two. If, if I if I guessed enough, I was gonna get the year right eventually. Eventually, you would get there, yeah. All right. So this version is directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and it stars Gary Oldman as Count Dracula. Can I help you? I was just yawning. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You just looked up up at me with those cute big eyes, Aww. like you had something to say. No, but thank you for calling me cute. Winona Ryder as Mina, Anthony Hopkins as Professor Abraham Van Helsing. Oh, Winona Ryder also plays Elisabetta, Dracula's former love when he was Vlad the Impaler. Keanu Reeves as Jonathan Harker. Richard E. Grant as Dr. Seward. This movie actually has Seward, unlike the last Dracula movie. Or has him in more than just one walk-on role. Carrie Elways as Arthur Holmwood. Billy Campbell as Quincy Morris. Finally, one of these Dracula movies has Quincy. He wasn't in the other two, and he's finally here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the only one that had him in the movie, which, yeah, it's kind of kind of odd. In the book, him, uh, Arthur, and Sue were both uh, chasing after Lucy's hand in marriage. And uh, she would eventually choose Arthur, but it uh, wouldn't matter because she dies. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. happens here, too. Yep. Sad to say. Sadie Frost plays Lucy here. And we also have Tom Waits as Renfield. And Monica Belushi as one of Dracula's brides. So, uh, this movie in particular has Bram Stoker's name in the title. So you would hope that it's a a pretty close adaptation to the story. You would hope that at least. Yeah, you would definitely hope that. If if his name's going to be on the title, you should probably try your best to stick to the book. And... For the most part, it is. There's some relatively minor stuff that they leave out here and there, but out of all of the Dracula movies we've been watching for this little... Settle down. Sorry. Out of this series, this comes the close to being the most accurate to the book. The problem, though, lies in what it adds to it, which... Let's talk about that. So, in this movie, there is an explicit connection made between Dracula and Vlad the Impaler, which, of course, Bram Stoker was inspired by the history of Vlad the Impaler to create Dracula. He took the name Vlad Dracula from him, so there's, there's nothing wrong with that addition. That's perfectly fine. But then, um, we get Dracula... Seeing, the, um, seeing his wife in Mina, which is really weird, and it makes him a more sympathetic character, which I'm of a few minds about this. On the one hand, I'm fine with him being sympathetic, but I don't know, I don't like how they did it quite much, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I never read the book, so I don't really, I don't really quite know exactly what's going on but um yeah that was definitely something new and not in the original material no it was not now i'm fine with them making him more sympathetic by giving him a wife in his in his previous life and then her she kills herself because in because one of his enemies he was fighting in battle or one of the enemy forces uh, sends a message to his castle that's saying he got killed in action. So she decides to throw herself off a cliff, 
and she dies. Then later on when Dracula comes back and finds her dead, I guess someone brought her back to the castle. Um, he says something about, uh, I'll see you again in, in heaven. And the priest there is like, nah, nah, she's, she, she's going to hell. She killed herself. And because of this, he renounces God and becomes a vampire. Same thing happens in Castlevania, actually. <laughs> now that I think about it, same basic, you know, story, but a little bit different. But that's so something else entirely. I wouldn't know anything about that, so. Now, there's one big problem, pretty glaring issue in this movie that everyone points to, and I hate to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to do it anyways. Keanu Reeves is terrible in this movie. Yeah, which is unfortunate because, I mean, Keanu Reeves is a good actor, and we all know this. He's proven that he's a good actor. Um, yes. Look, I love the guy. I do. There, no, I've seen so many stories about the guy, and no one has a bad word to say about him, personally. Mm -hmm. But let's not pretend he's the best actor there is. Yeah, I didn't say he was the best actor. Um, the, the man has his niche, and he he feels it great. You know, yeah. John Wick, Bill and Ted, um, other things I've seen him in. Yeah, but I do get what you're saying. He's not um, he's not the best. He's a great guy. I love him, but you know. Toy Story Four. Yeah, that was a good role. Yeah. So. It, the, it, it was uh, widely reported that uh, Francis Ford Coppola regretted casting him because he ended up being so horrible in the role. I, I feel bad saying that, <laughs> but that's not quite true, actually. Um, the reason why his, uh, well, mostly his accent is was so bad in it was because he was trying too hard to get it right, Coppola says. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know. I would not be able to do any accents for a movie besides my own. So, like, he, Reeves had a lot going on at the time. He had so many projects. So, he just couldn't 100% devote himself to this role, which is unfortunate. But at least the rest of the movie's all right. Or more than all right. It's so far, it's the best. It might be the best Dracula adaptation we've seen. In terms of book adaptation, book accuracy, I know there's a '70s BBC version that is more accurate technically, but I haven't seen, we have that, not one, seen that one, so yeah. I got nothing to say on that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's actually two other Americans in this movie that are also doing British accents, uh, them being Winona Ryder and Tom Waits, and they sound better. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not. A, I'm not British, so I can't really judge British accents too well. Yeah. But I know that Keanu Reeves is doing a bad one. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell either. I can tell if it's bad, but that's about it. Give him some credit, though. He's better than Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins, though. It's been forever since I've seen that movie. I trust you, though. Good. <laughs> so. Uh, what do you think of this movie? Um, it's alright. It's not my favorite because I kind of find myself losing attention as the movie goes on. Um, but other than that, I'd say it's okay. Yeah, I personally, this is personally one of my favorite Dracula movies. And I really like how this movie also has multiple narrators because in the book it's told from some from different people's point of view because we get a journal entry from um, from Jonathan Harker we'll get one from Mina one from Van Helsing we'll get a newspaper clipping here and there so it's kind of sort of like a found footage movie or an early one at that, that yeah I do like how they kept all the journal entries in they were because I know I mean I'm not I haven't read the book but I do know there's lots of journal entries and they kept those um, being narrated in the movie, which I thought was good. Yeah, and I, I like how they keep the uh, they keep the, the all the characters in the movie. You know, it's 
it's it's actually nice to see a Dracula movie with everyone in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is good. Uh, Hammer really dropped the ball on that one because we got we we got Dracula, of course. They all have that. Mina, Lucy, Arthur, uh, Harker, Van Helsing, but. I mean, let's be honest here. They, there, there's also diminished roles in those ones, but the same can be said here too because uh, Arthur, Quincy, and Seward are kind of background characters compared to everyone else. Yeah, I see what you mean. They don't have the biggest role, which is a shame because honestly, Carrie always is really good in this movie. Yeah, he is. Mm-hmm. And Richard E. Grant would later go on to play a vampire and the little vampire. He was the uh, the dad in that group. Okay. I am familiar with that movie, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he could play Dracula himself. Look at him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He could. Uh, now, another thing that this movie gets correct is they get more or less Dracula's death accurate to the books. In uh, in the 1931 version of Dracula, he gets staked. That's not how it happened. And oh. in Hammer, he gets exposed to sunlight. That's not how it happens. Because in the book, Dracula is able to walk in sunlight and live. He does that in this movie too. When uh Dracula gets to uh, London, he's in clear and uh, sunlight. No amb- no ambiguity at all. He's just. He pops out of a box, he's got no clothes on, and he's in the sunlight. Mm-hmm. Here, he gets he gets decapitated by and stabbed through the, the, the heart with knives. Now, that's not really how you're supposed to kill a vampire, according to the books, but, you know, it, it works. Yeah, as long as it works, you know, I don't really have too much complaints. There was a little bit more added here with... Um, um, Dracula lasting a little bit longer, making his way back into his castle, and Mina's the one who ends up finishing him off. But you know, it's closer than the other movies came. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, you could tell it's a lot closer for sure. And this movie is pretty—it's a bit over the top, in all honesty. Like the music, the the characters. They're all just exploding with drama. It's all just leaking out of every scene. And that could put a lot of people off. I'm not one of them, though. I love it. Yeah. Um, it For the movie, I think it fits. The, all the dramatics. Um, I think it, it, it works well together. Now, some people took issue with the fact that Lucy is, um, well, let's face it, kind of a slut in this movie. She wasn't really like that in the book. She was a she was a little flirty because you know she's got three guys after her, but she wasn't uh, you know uh, uh, yeah. thirsty. <laughs> but to be fair, she didn't really get too thirsty until after Dracula came and uh, yeah, put a little spell on her. I was, no, he put a little bit more than a <laughs> spell on her. <laughs> yeah. She, he uh wiener i got i got it babe thank you <laughs> as, as in his uh wolf form too yeah was that in the book new no. mm, okay yeah this movie is also a bit more sexual than the book whereas the book is more implied and there's overtones mm-hmm. here uh well we see dracula's brides with their boobas hanging out yeah there are some sex scenes. There's yeah. There's there's lots of uh, naked women in this movie. Like three, four, five, four, four and yeah, a half. Yeah, but it but it happens a lot too, like multiple times. Uh, so let's um uh, get out of this part. Um, would you like to know some trivia about this movie? Sure. So, originally, this was supposed to be a TV movie. Oh, okay. Weird. 
Uh, but Winona Ryder saw the script, brought it to the attention of Coppola, and they decided to make it to put more money in it. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, originally, Coppola wanted Johnny Depp to play Jonathan Harker, but the studio wanted someone who was more of a heartthrob. That's okay. I don't get it. Um, yeah, I don't get it either, but all right, whatever. Christian Slater was offered the role, but he turned it down. He wanted to play Dracula, I guess. Mm, I don't know who that is. Um, doesn't matter. Okay. Not for this purpose. I'll link him up later. Uh, Charlie Sheen also auditioned for the part of Jonathan Harker. Mm-hmm. I definitely wouldn't call him a heartthrob, but okay. Me neither, but um, I would have liked to see that. <laughs> Liam Neeson wanted the role of Van Helsing, but this is a little bit after Silence of the Lambs, so Anthony Hopkins wanted the role, so he got it. Mm, Yep, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, Coppola had several choices to to play Dracula. Um, Originally, he wanted Daniel Day-Lewis. That would have been interesting. You know, I'm kind of glad he didn't get the role because I feel like he would have made himself an actual vampire to do it. Yeah, he probably would have done something crazy like that. Though, Day-Lewis had played Dracula on stage before, just like Bela Lugosi before him. Oh, that's very interesting. He was busy with Last of the Mohicans at the time, though. Other candidates included Alec Baldwin. I'm better than this. Antonio Banderas. Nicholas Cage, of all people. Mm. He'd get to do it later on with Renfield. Yep. Mm. Colin Firth, Hugh Grant, Jeremy Irons. Oh, that would have been interesting. Michael Keaton, that's a bit on the nose. Ray Liotta, Kyle McLaughlin, Viggo Mortensen, uh, and Alan Rickman. Uh, that, that, yeah, that would have been pretty cool. You know, of the of, I'm, I'm glad that... Uh, I'm glad Gary Oldman got the role. But I would have loved to see an Alan Rickman Dracula. That would that would be pretty awesome, yeah. Um, Steve Buscemi was the first choice to play Renfield. That could have been something. Yeah, I like him a lot, so I'm sure I would have enjoyed him in this movie. That's all the uh, that's some of the interesting trivia I found. Overall, this is a very unique movie it's not for everyone but it's definitely for me yeah you know what it wasn't too bad it wasn't my favorite that we watched but um yeah it's all right all right who's your favorite character or is it is it too obvious um i i really don't know i really couldn't tell you i guess i guess dracula yeah me too (laughs) uh favorite part um let me think do you have a favorite part uh well it's hard to say really i i did really like the opening with uh the from the battle to him renouncing god and becoming a vampire that was really cool yeah it was cool i don't know i can't nothing's really popping into my mind right now that's all right we're uh, running a bit long on this one, so let's let's yeah. go get to the next one. Let's wrap it up. Uh huh. Next we have Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the uh, same thing with this one. If uh, you're gonna put the author's name on it, you better make it really accurate to the book. Mm-hmm. Follow what they intended. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in terms of accuracy, how do they do for you? As, it, yeah, you know, uh, for, for for, I'm asking the opinion of a uh, well-versed connoisseur of Frankenstein. What's your professional opinion on the matter? Mm-hmm. My professional opinion is that out of all the Frankenstein movies I have seen, this one is definitely the closest. Um, there's a lot that's included that I don't see in other Frankenstein movies. Um, I still think they left a lot out, but it's hard to capture the themes and the like inner workings of Frankenstein's mind on a movie screen. 
Um, however, I think this movie did a really good job with what they had. They even added a little more, too, which um, was interesting, I will say, because um, in the book, Frankenstein does, or well, the Frankenstein's monster does ask Frankenstein to make him a wife. However, in the book, Frankenstein never gets around to do that. But in this movie, he actually does make a... Well, he brings Elizabeth back to life. So, um, that was not in the book. But that was very an interesting detail. Um, which, you know, uh, for the movie, I thought it was alright. Added in. Um, I noticed that they uh, changed some, some details around here and there from the book to this movie. For instance, um, when... Um, when... What's your face? Justine was getting lynched. Frankenstein didn't actually know that the monster was the one who killed his little brother. So he actually wasn't able to clear her name. Yeah, it makes him a little bit more sympathetic in that scene. Because, yeah, at the book, he could have said something to stop it. But in this moment in the movie, there was nothing he could do to stop Justine from getting killed. Yeah, he like literally just got back to his father's house. Doesn't didn't even know that his uh, little brother was killed yet. You know he's just uh, seeing everything as it plays out as it gets to Justine's execution, and then they just hang her. Yeah. Speaking of little brother William, um, is this the only movie he's in? Of uh, the ones we've seen, yes. I think so. He's a character that yeah doesn't get brought up a lot in the movies, so it was nice to see. You know, characters that aren't usually talked about uh, finally get some screen time. Anyways, um, so this movie was directed by the world's biggest William Shakespeare fan, not sitting on this couch with me right now, <laughs> Kenneth Branagh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I, th- I think he may be a bigger one than you. Yes, that is for sure. Francis Ford Coppola was actually originally supposed to direct this after he did Dracula, but he didn't. Oh, okay. I think he's still on as a producer, though, which makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Now, this movie stars Robert De Niro as the creature. Yeah, he, you know, he did a good job because um, I thought uh, it was pretty book accurate, his portrayal of the creature. Aside from his uh, lack of long hair, that is. Yeah, but... uh, This creature was strong and intelligent, um, and we actually got to see him learn to read and write, so that was pretty good. That he learns after hiding out in the blind man's house. Yeah, Um, so that was, you know, pretty good um, representation from the book there. Personally, this is one of my favorite roles from De Niro. He's, you know, he completely disappears into this role, and you don't see De Niro, you see the creature. Yeah, mm mm-hmm. Yeah, he does a really good job. It also helps, of course, that he is behind Academy Award-nominated makeup, which, let's just give some props to the to the makeup team for this movie. They did fantastic. Yeah, mm-hmm, it looks really good. And I like, because you can see him heal throughout as time's passing. Did you notice that? His, uh, his get- scars are very prominent when at the beginning, but as time goes on, they fade. Did you notice? I don't think I did consciously, but I think it was like at the, in the back of my mind, it mm-hmm. makes more sense. Yeah, I noticed. And I was like, that's a really good detail to include. Plus the fact that he has two different color eyes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Frankenstein definitely, uh, he, he, he definitely went through a lot of bodies in order to get to this, to make his creature. Yeah, well, he had to pick and choose. He wanted a, a good body. Speaking of Frankenstein, he is played by the director, Kenneth Branagh. Yep. Um, yeah. No, I, I actually, I don't know why I did that. I have nothing <laughs> bad to say about him in this role. He's very, very sympathetic, but still clearly in over his head. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he did fine. Um, you know, I might have wanted to see a different actor as Frankenstein, but... Yeah. I, I, I don't have any complaints. 
Tom Hulse plays his friend Henry. Some of you may know Tom Hulse as Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from the movie Amadeus. Oh, I've never seen it. So. Or Quasimodo in Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame. Okay, I have seen that. He's just a nice guy in this movie. He's having trouble passing anatomy, but he's he's just there for Victor. Yeah, yeah, they become good friends. Helena Bonham Carter plays uh, Frankenstein's adopted sister, Elizabeth. Yep, adopted sister and, and fiancé. And fiancé. <laughs> uh, fun, funny story. Uh, Kenneth Branagh and Helena Bonham Carter met on this, on this movie, and they uh, ended up being together for around five years. Oh, yeah. That, that is interesting. Yeah, I don't think his wife was too happy about that, though. <laughs> Definitely not. Aiden Quinn plays Captain Walton, the the ship captain who Frankenstein meets at the beginning of the movie. That's another character yeah. we rarely see. I was just about to say, that's another guy who is not in any other movie. So, yeah, that, that really shows you the, uh, re- really the depths of accuracy they went to with this movie. Mm-hmm, yeah. Ian Holm plays Frankenstein's father. John Cleese plays Professor Waldman, his college mentor, in a rare serious role for him, or at least rare for, that I've seen. Yeah, you always see him in funny comedic roles, so this was uh, this was very different for me. He was very no nonsense, and mm-hmm. it works somehow. Yeah, I thought he did a perfectly fine job. Uh, let's see. Sherry Lungi plays Frankenstein's mother. Celia Emery plays Mrs. Moritz. Uh, I guess she's a housekeeper at the house. Trevor McDowell plays Justine, the uh, maid who uh, ends up getting lynched because they think he, that she killed William. Speaking of William, he is played by Ryan J.W. Smith. Is it, is it, is it just me, or, or, or is it kind of... Kind of, kind of cool that he has two middle initials. You sure? Yeah. I don't know. It just, it just <laughs> rolls off the tongue better. All right. And I didn't know this going into the movie, but uh, one of uh, Frankenstein's college professors is played by Robert Hardy, also known to um, to younger fans as Cornelius Fudge in the Harry Potter movies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. This movie is just overflowing with Harry Potter actors. It's kind of kind of funny, but given that this is a British production, they have four actors in the entire country, and half of them were were in Harry Potter movies. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we already already talked about how uh, you feel about this as an adaptation. Yeah. Which was you know, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I, from what I've, from what I've uh, heard about it, this definitely seems like one of the better adaptations of this movie from the book, and they, and and that really shows. Yeah, um, I don't know, I mean, I haven't really seen too many Frankenstein movies, um, but yeah, from what I've seen, this is the one that, um, is closest to the book. Now, as far as uh, themes of science and really man's ambition going past his grasp or whatever the hell David Bowie said in The Prestige, how do you think this measures up to the book's message of that? Um, it's definitely not as strong in the movie. There's still there's something that you can't quite transfer from the book to the movie and like i said earlier the like the strong themes the strong messages are still in the movie but i feel like they aren't quite as um you know what's the word i'm trying to say aren't quite as pronounced as embellished or yeah pronounced something like that so uh remember when the uh, dark universe was a was a thing no exactly it, it it was going to start with uh, Dracula Untold, starring um, um, 
I forget his name, but he he was the bad guy in Fast and Furious Six. Luke Evans. That was supposed to be the start of it, but that bombed. So they decided we're going to start over again with 2017's The Mummy. Didn't happen there either. But uh, originally they had a Frankenstein movie starring Javier Bardem as the creature lined up. That would be cool. With Angelina Jolie as the bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's not happening anymore though. Mm. But we are getting Guillermo del Toro's Frankenstein yeah, that should be cool. Supposedly, it stars Andrew Garfield as Doctor Frankenstein. Yeah, um, yeah. I I hope it's loyal to the book, but um, we'll see. Also, in the cast that's been announced so far has been Oscar Isaac and Christoph Waltz. Uh, from the looks of it, maybe it's Christoph Waltz as no, not Christoph Waltz. Uh, Oscar Isaac as the monster, or maybe Henry. Yeah, maybe. I I don't know. Okay. Um. So some trivia about this. Mm. Going to skip over that one. Uh, Tim Burton was originally, um, well, at one point was courted to direct this movie. Oh, okay. And he wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger as the creature. Oh my. I- that, yeah, he would have been a very strong uh, monster. That's not funny. It's a little funny, I guess. I, I wasn't trying to make it funny. <laughs> uh, Brano initially wanted Gerard Depardieu as the creature. That name sounds familiar, but I don't know who that is. Don't worry about it. He's French. All right. Um... But the studio didn't think that he would have strong enough box office appeal. I can see that since I don't know who that is. Uh, Andy Garcia and Jeremy Irons. There he is again. <laughs> and John Malkovich were also considered for the monster. I mean. Yeah, yeah, you know. Willem Dafoe was offered the role of Victor Frankenstein. Interesting. Um... Christopher Lambert was cast as Henry before being replaced by Tom Hulse initially. Oh, okay. Uh, Emma Thompson was the first choice for Elizabeth, you know, Kenneth Branagh's wife at the time. Oh. But she had other commitments. Mm. If only she was. Oh, well. <laughs> so, what would you say was your favorite part of this movie? Um... I don't really know. Because the only thing that comes to my mind is it's not really like a part, but it's just that I'm very appreciative that there were things in the movie that have never been in another Frankenstein movie I've seen, if that makes sense. I just liked the inclusion of William and Justine and... The Captain. The Captain Walden. Walton. Walter Walton. You got a most I knew correct. somebody. Um yeah. So I w- I was really appreciative of that. What about you? <coughs> you know, I I kind of feel the same way, but I I really like the the scenes with the the monster at the blind man's house. Yeah, that's really good. Uh that was a good part. You know, like with um recently the last voyage of the Demeter taking a look at uh, an overlooked part of the story of Dracula, I feel like a whole movie could be made just based on Frankenstein's monster at the blind man's house. Yeah, it, it could. It was a big part of the book. I was just about to call him Frankenstein, but I caught myself just in time. <laughs> nice. I mean, I mean, it's it's sometimes it's easy to slip into that, especially when you realize that in Abbott and Costello, they call the they're basically calling the monster Frankenstein. Yeah. It's it's just kind of accepted at this point. It's because of those two screwballs that people call him Frankenstein. Is it? I don't know. I'm blaming them anyways. <laughs> All right. That's fine then. But then again, since the monster considers Frankenstein his father, I guess you can call him Frankenstein. Yeah, that that's how names would work, so it's I don't know. Technically correct, but... um. I'm going to try my hardest just to keep calling him the creature or the monster. Yeah. 
So next we have the 2010 version of The Wolfman. I uh, found out too late that we could have actually watched Wolf starring Jack Nicholson on YouTube for free. But by that point, we'd already watched the the Wolfman, so you know um, what? We're sticking with it. Yep, we're sticking with the Wolfman. We'll see you in a bit. So, the Wolfman. This movie was directed by Joe Johnson, best known for Jurassic Park three and Captain America: The First Avenger, and The Rocketeer. Huh. the The man has a uh, interesting filmography. But I can't say I don't like any of his movies. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen all of them, but from what I've seen, they're pretty okay. This movie starred Benicio Del Toro as Lawrence Talbot. Great, great casting there. I love Benicio Del Toro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't really seen him in a lot of things, but... Um, I honestly think this is the first movie I've seen where he's the lead... Um, yeah, I haven't shown you Sicario, uh-uh. but you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy uh-uh. and Infinity War. Yeah, so, um, seeing him in a leading role is, uh, really, really nice. Yeah, it's much deserved. He's a fantastic actor. Mm-hmm. The movie also stars Emily Blunt as his brother's fiance Gwen. Um, Anthony Hopkins as Talbot's father, Sir John Talbot. Um, let's see Rick Baker d- did the makeup for this movie and he also stars as a gypsy man who gets killed yeah he gets killed pretty quickly Yeah, Rick Baker does a great job with makeup I'm sure I've sung his praises a few times before but I'm going to do it again he he does a great job he does great <laughs> great work you know, he's worked on How to Grinch Stole Christmas um the 1976 version of King Kong, um, Harry and the Hendersons, among a whole host of work. He is just fantastic. And, you know, he's a he's a horror fan just like us. So he's, you know, he gets to work in the genre that he loves. And I couldn't be more jealous of, of someone. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Hugo Weaving plays a uh, police constable, Aberlene who uh, rightfully su- suspects Talbot, but, like, also, it's not really too much, because, like, there's no proof at all that he w- he's the one doing this at first. But then it's like, okay, yeah, he, he does end up doing it later. So yeah. you're right, but a bit, you jumped the gun a, a bit, buddy. A little early, yeah. Yeah, he just guessed it a little early. So this movie's plot is, uh, is similar to the 1941 version, except it's more violent Oh, yeah, it is pretty violent. Which, we get a really cool transformation scene. We get lots of bloody gore and violence. We get just a whole lot of werewolf action. Yeah, um, it was pretty enjoyable. So, uh, spoiler alert. It's important for this movie because, uh, yeah. But, uh... Talbot's father, Sir John, is the is the initial werewolf in this movie, and he's the one who later infects uh, Lawrence. Yeah, um, I kind of saw that coming at some point, but um, it was still like a, a pretty good twist. You're like, oh, so he was a Wolfman all along, which makes sense because there's lots of wolf statues everywhere in his house, so you would think. I should have caught on quicker. Yeah, plus his manservant Singh having silver bullets on hand. Yeah. Wish that could just be because the wolfman's around. I mean, that's true. There's... I mean, clearly people in this town are knowledgeable about werewolves, which mm-hmm. I think is kind of kind of neat because none of these people are really incompetent. You know, they don't deny the existence of, of a wolfman. They... When the... When one starts coming out again, okay, guys, let's melt all of the silver stuff and make all the bullets we can. We need this right now, yesterday. <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah, I guess that's because uh, since uh, the dad, Sir Talbot, what's his name? Sir John. Sir John uh, has been around 
for a while, they kind of get used to having a wolfman around, so they know they need a. Well, no, because he was, he'd be uh, locked up in a in that cage. Yeah, well, he got out at some point. I bet he's got out a few times before. Well, like he said, he uh, sometimes he would knock Sing out because that's how he would end up killing his uh, first son and uh, his wife. Yeah, and then he would send uh, Lawrence to uh, an asylum so he would get the memory tortured out of him. Yeah, mm hmm. Which happens again. Like, this guy's an awful father. Yeah, not not a good dad, no. Great performance <laughs> from Anthony Hopkins, which, this is the second movie we're talking about today that he was in. Yeah, yep. Only this time he's the bad guy and the monster. Mm hmm. Well, yeah. One of them. Yeah, mm hmm. Uh, so, yeah, this is a very, very interesting, very fun movie. I love the, uh, I love the violence in it. Uh, yeah, I did too. It was, uh, yeah, probably the the most violent of all the movies we've seen, this one, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. We get, uh, all sorts of ewy, disgusting, gross guts and innards all over the place. We get lots of on-screen gory kills, which... This movie is already head and shoulders above the the Hammer Wolfman movie because mm. we get Wolfman action within like a minute oh, of yeah. the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as soon as it starts, there's a Wolfman. And we see a lot of him. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He's in it a lot. Yep. Which we talked about how the last movie had Oscar-nominated makeup. This had Oscar-winning makeup oh. by our man Rick Baker. Yeah, um... Sorry, I was adjusting my list. Um, yeah, I, it was really good. The Wolfman looked really cool, I thought. Yeah, like, I, I liked the look of both Wolfman because uh, we see Aunt J Sir John, and he, it's like, it, they took the natural progression of taking Anthony Hopkins' face and natural features and then just werewolfing them. Yeah, they both looked really good. Just a bit of a spoiler for uh, the ranking. I don't like this one as much as the 1941 version, but I like the werewolf isms a lot more. I agree. Yeah, um, yeah. It just I think yeah, werewolf looked really good. Speaking of the 1941 version, we got a neat callback to that that one with uh, the the wolf cane that Lawrence gets on the train from. Max Vine side owl's character who is only, who only appears in the unrated director's cut which I mean the movie still isn't very long it's only around two hours but hey that was a cool scene Max Von Sydow was always a pleasure to watch on screen and it's unfortunate that he's no longer with us yeah that was a a cool detail to add so uh, what would you say was your favorite part of this there are a lot of good parts in this movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, I like... Um, like I said, there's a lot of good parts, but I think I'm going to go with the part where he's in the asylum and the guy has packed a room full of like colleagues and he's going to show them that he has, quote, cured... Lawrence um, of being afraid of the full moon and so he's going to he brings Lawrence out to set in the full moon he's tied to a chair and everyone's going to watch him um, as he not transform yeah not transform and like get cured of this fear of the moon um, but as we know he is a werewolf so um, he turns into a werewolf and kills the people who have been torturing him which was you know kind of kind of nice to see um and then he escapes and runs amok amok on the streets of london which um had some pretty violent parts so yeah <laughs> i was gonna say the exact same scene <laughs> it's a good scene it's a good scene i, lo I love the the build-up where he's uh visibly Changing and all the all the doctors in the uh, arena are just like trying to point out hey, he's changing, he's changing. <laughs> There's something but, going on. <laughs> but the, like the main guy is like, ah, he's like, ah, it's fine, it's, it's okay. He's not going to change. And then he does, and he just <laughs> goes wild. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. 
But uh, another scene I really liked that I thought I was was probably not as funny as I'm taking it. But um, uh, the one of the first times that that um, Lawrence transforms into the Wolfman, and he's killing all these people, you know, who set a trap for him. And there's this one guy who gets stuck in the in like mud up to his uh, chest, and he's he's shooting his gun at, at Lawrence. And then he realized, okay, I'm probably going to die really horribly. So he goes to kill himself, only for the gun to click. But then Lawrence just takes his head off all the same. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, (laughs) In a morbid way, yeah. It was funny. It's like, I mean, you didn't really have to worry too much. You you still died either way. Yeah, a quick death. He got a quick death. You know, he, you know, Lawrence probably was like, okay, you know, you were going to die anyways. I'll do you a fa- I'll do you a solid. Just, just chop your head off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's just very, very violent. Of course, I'm kind of a sick guy, so morbid stuff like that is always going to make me <laughs> laugh. <laughs> yeah, it it was pretty funny. Um, but you know, in a twisted sort of way. So, um, let's see. Uh, unfortunately, this movie bombed pretty hard at the box office. It had a budget of around 150 million, and made not even 140 million. Mm. That's kind of unfortunate because um, I I enjoyed watching it. Uh, so Benicio del Toro and Rick Baker just leaped at the chance to work on this movie because they both really love the original. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Let's see, there's a there's around 20 minutes of footage that was left out of the final cut, the meaning the the director's cut, which um from the sound of it, it sounds a lot more violent because he kills a whole bunch of people during a masquerade ball. It's oh my ah oh, to get that that'd be great. <laughs> I bet so. Yeah, I would like to see that. So uh, Benicio del Toro is a Puerto Rican Spanish actor, and honestly. He does good as an English as the English American Lawrence Talbot. Yeah, I thought so. Like, not to uh, belabor a point, but Benicio del Toro is a fantastic actor, and he, I love watching him work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I really enjoyed him, him in this uh, role. So Joe Johnson was not the uh, he wasn't the first m- man to be uh, uh, attached to this movie. Originally, uh, Mark Romanek was was uh to direct it he did one hour photo brett ratner was the uh first was the guy that the studio wanted to uh, replace him he did uh x-men the last stand among other movies uh studio also met with james mangold martin campbell and bill condon i don't know who those people are james mangold did walk the line in logan martin campbell did uh casino royale golden eye uh the live action green lantern movie and Bill Condon did, um, okay, I'm looking at his filmography. I don't like a whole lot of what I'm seeing because he did, uh, the 2017 Beauty and the Beast movie, mm. but he also did Dream Girl, so that's, that's nice. I don't know. That hasn't looked like I've seen all of here, a lot of those. Uh, let's see. Oh, really? That's it for trivia? Okay, that's nice. Um, so, yeah, a uh, perfectly fine movie. Uh, it could have been better, but you could say that about a lot of movies, honestly. Yeah, you could. I think as long as you enjoyed watching it, then, then it did what it needed to do. Now, next is going to be a movie that we've already covered, but um, we're doing it again. 1999's The Mummy. So, The Mummy, 1999. We've already covered this movie, along with the rest of its trilogy, but uh, why are we doing it again? Because we love watching it. This is true, and we didn't want to watch the 2017 version with Tom Cruise. That is true. Basically, if uh, you ever feel the inkling to watch the 2017 version, just put the 99 version in instead, you'll have a much better time. I assume so. I've never seen the 2017 one, but judging by my love for the 1999 version, I'm sure that um, it is way better than the other one. Yes, it is. (laughs) Now, um, 
What can we say about this version that we didn't already say in the first one? Not a lot, because I feel like we've covered this one uh, pretty in depth. Yes, we did. Um, so we're just going to get into some trivia that I'm positive that we didn't get to before. But you know what? We're going to... Eh. We'll see. Yeah, go ahead with your trivia. So Arnold Vosloo had to uh, get his body shaved completely, like at least twice a day during filming. I bet so, because he's pretty smooth in that movie. I don't see any hair on him besides, like, you know, eyebrows. Does he even have eyebrows? Uh, yeah? I think so. Anyways, um, which is accurate to the time. During, uh, during funerals, all the priests would shave themselves completely, including their eyebrows. And, you know, in, in mourning. That's crazy. Brendan Fraser was accidentally almost hung for real during his hanging scene <laughs> we may have talked about this before but yeah that's insane like he, he had to be actually resuscitated oh my <laughs> that's so scary and uh. arnold Vosloo, when he was getting wrapped up in bandages was pretty terrified like the look you see on his face when he's putting in put, getting put in the sarcophagus was completely real yeah um, i'm sure that was an uncomfortable scene to film. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't want to, either. That's just. Uh, yeah. I don't like that. I think I'd rather be almost hung than have that happen to me. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I'm sure I, I would get wrapped up. I think that would be okay. I like to be snug. I feel like you'd be snug. <laughs> and put it in the sarcophagus. Well, I would know I'm being taken out because. I'm an actor. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the hanging. <laughs> sure. Okay. You can you can take that. Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, the library scene where Evie accidentally knocks over all those bookshelves. Yeah. It had to be done in one take. <laughs> oh, my. But that's good, though. It, it turned out nice. Um, let's see. What else? What else? What else? Uh, apparently, this movie wasn't expected to do well in the theaters. Um, why not? Well, it was a sort of remake of a semi-obscure movie from the 1930s. You know, it had a cast of mostly unknowns, but then it made bank. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good movie, even even if um you don't take into account the acting because um, it's really good you know what I'm saying like by the time I've watched this movie they're all really well known actors but if I go back to 1999 when I was just two years old maybe um, I lost where I was going with this point the point is it's a good movie it has a good plot I think the <laughs> biggest thing that Brenda Fraser had at that point was George of the Jungle which yeah that's probably would have you know, helped helped him out a lot, but th this is the thing that really put him on the map. Yeah, I can tell it's a really good movie, and he did a good job. So yeah, I, I I'm sure it helped his career out a lot. It would also do the same for Rachel Weisz and Odette Fair. That makes sense. Yeah. Funny story though, Ardeth Bay was not supposed to survive the movie. Oh yeah. Like when he was uh, fighting the mummies at Hamanaptra at the end, and then uh, he gets blown up by Rick. Um, he was supposed to die there, but the director, Stephen Summers, changed his mind because he, he liked him so much. Yeah, <laughs> he is a, a really cool character. Uh, something I don't think we touched on during our last time talking about this movie, but it's really funny. What? The, the movie. Oh, the... That that fact. The, no, the movie itself is. Oh, funny. it's funny. <laughs> I don't know what. It is. It has good humor and good jokes. Um, I like it. I enjoy it. Really, really quotable. I was basically saying all the lines word for word when we were watching it. Yeah, you've seen it a few times, so. Uh, maybe two or three times. <laughs> yeah. So originally, Leonardo DiCaprio was approached for the role of Rick. That would have been interesting, but I think Brendan Fraser was better suited. I mean, they basically have the same haircut as DiCaprio had in Titanic, but I think Fra Fraser pulls it off better. Mm, 
It depends. Uh, he was he had to turn it down to do, due to uh, other commitments. Yeah. Other actors that who are considered for the role were Brad Pitt. Could have been interesting that seeing that. Yeah, uh, maybe. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, Chris O'Donnell, Matthew McConaughey, and Tom Cruise. Yeah, I, th- I think Brendan Fraser was definitely the best choice there. Yeah, me too. Now, this movie went through a uh, development hell to get made. Just a few of the uh, actors who were who were considered for the role for the job were Joe Dante and George Romero. That would have been interesting. Um. Yeah, I I just don't know many directors, so that's more your thing. Um. Yeah, George Romero did the. Uh, you know, Night of the Living Dead, yeah, Dawn of the Dead, Land yes. of the Dead. Yeah. I don't know the other guy, though. Uh, Joe Dante, he did Gremlins. Oh, okay. So, uh, long story short, we love this movie, and we are always down to watch it. Definitely. So, that wraps up our thoughts on all of these movies. But, before we go, we're going to do a bit of a ranking for all of them, because... We said we would. Yep. I think I got mine. I think. You think you got yours? I think so. Maybe. Okay. We'll see. Uh, do you want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Going from worst to best. In my opinion, the worst one is Curse of the Werewolf. The Hammer Wolfman movie which just didn't do it for me. It meandered a bit too much. It ha- didn't have enough Wolfman, and really, the lead was not very likable in character. Oliver Reed himself did a good job with his performance, but I did not like his character. Now, the jump between this one and the number 11 spot are like the jump in quality is massive, so don't think anything bad of me for putting this next one at number 11. Number 11 for me is 1931 Dracula. It's a perfectly fine movie. I liked it better when I was younger, but it just didn't do the job for me this time around. Like, it's fine, but it's not great. Number 10 is Frankenstein, 1931. Same thing with Dracula, except I like this one a little bit more. Number 9 is 2010's Wolfman. A great gory time, just lacked a bit of substance. Number 8 is... Uh, Hammer's Dracula movie Horror of Dracula uh, uh, Step in the right direction from the Universal version but still needed a bit more book accuracy for me to like it more Number 7 is 1932's The Mummy A really good movie but somehow it's both faster paced and slower paced than the 99 Mummy I don't know that's weird <laughs> Number six is Bram Stoker's Dracula. A fine movie, a bit over the top, which can be a bit too much for me, but overall, I, I really do like it. Uh, just could have done without the uh, Dracula falling in love with Mina. That For some reason, that really s- sours my mood sometimes. Number five is 1999's Mummy. Probably going to get, a, get uh, some hate for putting this above the 1932 version, but, you know, I don't care. This movie is just too entertaining and too fun to not put lower than that one just because that one is older. Now, if you like the, the 1932 version better, that's perfectly fine. That's It's a perfectly good movie, and it's f- f- nice and valid for you to like that one more. Number four is the 1941 Wolfman. Fun time. I would have liked if we got a better werewolf transformation, but... As is, it's a great time. Number three is the Hammer version of The Mummy. Great. I'm just, I'm just repeating myself a lot. It's a great time, and I loved every minute of it. Though it can be a bit slow, it's still a fine time to spend, fine way to spend an afternoon. Number two is Hammer's Curse of Frankenstein. A, a really good... Uh, first step in their Frankenstein universe and 
I just love Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, which can be said about any of these other ones that they starred in together. And number one is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I really liked how accurate this was to the book, and I just had a great time with it. Yeah. So what about you? I'm surprised that was your number one. Uh, mine are a little different than yours. There's some we have the same. So. Well, I, I went back, back and forth between Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and the Hammer Frankenstein for my number one. Like I was trying to step between those two, but eventually I figured Mary Shelley's was the more sophisticated adaptation, mm. and it just did it better for me. Yep. Uh, so mine, as always, I base mine on my own opinion of just how much I enjoyed them. Um, so yeah, let's begin. Uh, my least favorite, so I just put like Hammer Wolfman. I couldn't remember the names of all the Hammer movies, so I just put Hammer this or Hammer that. So bear with me. Um, but the Hammer Wolfman, which is the Curse of the Werewolf, right? Yeah. Yeah. It started off like yours, um, least favorite. It was the only one that I honestly didn't like. Um, yeah, same for me. Yeah. So like you said, this the next one, there's like, yeah, a huge jump. This is the only one out of all these movies that I wasn't a fan of. So this next movie, even though it is down low, I still enjoy it. Um, but the next one I did was The Mummy 1932. Uh, for me, although I do enjoy it, like I said, it's a good movie. It's a classic, but I just, uh, for me, the mummy monster, you know, I just didn't quite jive with it like I do the other monsters. You mean vibe? Jive, baby. I jive. Anyway. I don't think that's how that works, <laughs> but keep going. <laughs> um, so the, my next one is Dracula, classic Dracula. Again, Dracula is a classic monster, but the movie is a little slow for me, and there's others that I enjoyed more. Next, I have The Hammer Mummy. Um, like I said, I don't remember the titles of the Hammer movies, so I'm sorry, but again, The Mummy Monster is not my favorite. Uh, after that, I have The Hammer Dracula. What's that one called? The Hammer Dracula. Horror of Dracula. Horror of Dracula. Um, it was all right. Um, but again, I'm just basing these off of just how much I enjoyed watching them. Um, after that comes Frankenstein, classic Frankenstein. It's a classic, so you can't, you know, it, it's, an, it's, enjoy, it's an enjoyable time. Um, after that comes Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, a pretty fun watch. Um, after that is The Wolfman 2010. I did enjoy that one more than Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, I, I'm not saying that it's a better quality movie, but I just had a better time watching it. I, um, felt myself being entertained more by watching it. Yeah, and, and there's one thing that, uh, I, I feel like that Wolfman has over that Dracula. It's a lot more violent. Mm-hmm. It is. <laughs> Which is kind of mandatory for a Wolfman movie. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be some violence. Uh, the next step is the Hammer, Hammer Frankenstein. Um, although it's not like the book at all, I did find myself enjoying the movie. So, Frankenstein was just really mean in that movie. So That's, that's why I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my next step up is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is my number three. Okay. I, di I didn't have them numbered, so now I'll try to number them. So my num top number three is Mary Shelley Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, I really enjoyed it. I would rather read the book, but you know what? This is the closest adaptation of the book that I have seen. Um, really enjoyable. I feel like that there was lots of love and uh, hard work put into this movie to make it as close to the book as they could. So really appreciated that. Um, my number two pick is The Wolfman. It's classic. Um, it's my favorite classic monster movie, and it just holds up really well. I just really like it. And, of course, my number one is The Mummy 1999 because even though, like, I know I just said that The Mummy is not my favorite monster, but yet this movie is so entertaining. It's so much fun that... Um, yeah, I could put it on and watch it probably any time. So, 
Uh, so yeah, so it's it's on the top of my list. Yeah. Before we go, um, I just want to do one last thing. Okay. For each of these monsters, let's see who we think play did them the best. All so, right. I'll try. I gotta go shower soon. <laughs> anyways, Dracula. Who do you think did the did Dracula the best? You go first. Christopher Lee. I was leaning towards Christopher. I'll stick with Christopher Lee. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he had a, an animal ferocity as well as a uh, dignified gentleman nature or faux gentleman nature that should that Dracula should have. Yeah, um, I did enjoy his performance the most. I think. What about? Well, Frankenstein monster and Fr- and Doctor Frankenstein. Who do you think did the the best creature? The best creature, uh, Robert De Niro, because of the book accuracy. True, and he's the only one in these movies that actually got to talk. Yeah, that is true. He had more to do with his character, you know. Although going by, if we're going by, uh, let's say, Bride of Frankenstein, where Boris Karloff's Frankenstein monster did speak, I still go De Niro, honestly. Yeah, he did a really good job. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say De Niro as well. What about what about Doctor Frankenstein? That's uh, give me a second on that one. I'll uh, you go first. I'm gonna say Peter Cushing. Uh, he was a absolute insane mad doctor who is too overwhelmed by his ambition and his desire to create life, bring something back that it just consumes him too much and he ends up being a victim to his own hubris. And I believe him in this role f- completely. You know, not to say anything bad about Colin Clive or Kenneth Branagh, they did excellent as well. But Peter Cushing, man. Yeah. Even though even though I really like the book accuracy for Frankenstein um I'm gonna have to agree with you Peter Cushing did a really good job um the hammer Frankenstein was higher on my list than what I thought it would be and I think it was because of uh Peter Cushing so yeah well the man never gave more never gave less than 110 percent in any of his Mm -hmm. roles if he was in it he was doing the best job he could yeah it yeah it's very, very entertaining. All right, what about the Wolfman? I mean, you know, I got to go with Lon Chaney Jr. I I actually can't decide between mm. him and Benicio Del Toro. They both did really good, but I'm going to stick with classic um, Lon Chaney Jr. I like to watch him in any role he plays. Um, like I said, maybe that's just because I haven't seen Benicio Del Toro very much. Uh, but I, I gotta go with Lon Chaney Jr. for this one. It does help that we get to see uh, Lon Chaney Jr. play the Wolfman a lot more than Del Toro ever did, which is unfortunate because, yeah, I would have loved to see a sequel to this with. Well, then again, his Wolfman died at the end, but so did Lon Chaney Jr.'s. Yeah, but yeah, he somehow still came back. Um, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at the end of uh. Del Toro's Wolfman, Hugo Weaving's character got bit by him, so maybe he would have been the next Wolfman. Yeah. Or, you know, let's find a way to bring Del Toro back. Why not? Yeah, that is a good point I never mentioned was at the end of that Wolfman movie, the Wolfman still lived on even after he died. I forgot to say that. Anyways, oh well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, I'm, I can't decide between these two. They did fantastic. I'm staying with Lon Chaney Jr. And now, The Mummy. Who did The Mummy the best for you? Probably Boris Karloff. Well. Yes. <laughs> I have to think. They're all pretty good. They all basically have the same story. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to... It's kind of hard to choose. Look, between Boris Karloff, Christopher Lee, and Arnold Vosley, none of them did a bad job. Yeah. 
they're all pretty good. Very menacing and creepy as the mummy. How about which one scared you the most? <laughs> Still nothing? <laughs> Well, I was thinking the one that scared me the most was the recent one, but I think that was just because he looked creepy because of the technology at the time. So I don't think that counts. That's true. He was uh, one of the earliest examples of motion capture being used in movies. Yeah. So that's what I was. That's why he's the creepiest. So I don't think that counts for me. So I'm. Okay. Um, which one did you like the most? <laughs> Which one did you like the most? Yeah, I don't know either. Christopher Lee. Well, Bo- I'm going to go with Boris Karloff on this one. Actually. I think. It's not Christopher Lee for me. I think I'm going to go with Boris Karloff. Well, see, it, it it's not Christopher Lee for me because he doesn't really get to say a whole lot. No, that's true. He just kind of goes he, about, he does whatever he he's around told. And, yeah. and he's basically a force of nature, which is... Which is creepy and all, and mm-hmm. he looks intimidating, but as far as character goes, we don't get a whole lot of that from him. Yeah. Like I said, I think it's Boris Karloff for me. I'm going to have to go Arnold Laszlo. He, I do enjoy his performance, but I'm going to go with the, the classic creepy guy. Like, you look at this guy, and you just know he's... He, he's, he's a bad dude. He's a bad dude. Mm-hmm. He's got... And if he's got you in his crosshairs, you're going down. Yeah. He's just, he just looks cool both as the mummy and when he regenerates. Yeah, yeah, he does. So that is the end of this series of monsters. Um, I had a good time watching these movies. I got to see some movies that I have never seen before. So that was really fun. Yeah, me too. Um, some of these I hadn't seen in a while, like the Universal ones. Some of them I'd never seen at all, like um, the 2010 Wolfman. And um, unfortunately, we came across a bad one, but all the same, it, I've seen worse than that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen worse. And even then, there's still some stuff of substance in that movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm not sure if, this, if uh, we'd be able to do something like this again next year. We can see. Yes, we will. Um, there's not really a whole lot of other monsters that were used throughout the years in different eras of uh, movie history, but we could sure try our best. We can. So that'll do it for us. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye. See you next time.